Another episode of Loving Daily. I'm your host today, Benjamin Abella, together with Sam. How are you, Sam? I'm fantastic. How are you, Ben? I'm good, thank you. So today, today's episode is going to be pretty jam-packed. Apart from the usual five stories, we're also going to be interviewing the president of MEIA, Howard Keith De Bono. But before we jump into that, here are today's five stories. Maltese tech company dumps Donald Trump for breach in anti-hate rules. School guidelines for kindergarten and post-secondary published. Sister of Sweetie Murder victim speaks out after suspect released on bail again. Animal Welfare Director speaks out amid backlash and Entertainment Lobby proposes COVID-19 vouchers for the arts. So, Sam, you want to kick us off with the first story of the day? For sure. So, um, Hotjar, which is a major analytics company um, born and based in Malta, has announced that Trump will no longer be allowed to make use of its services. So Trump's um, merch website and other um, websites used by the Republican Party will no longer be able to use the analytic services of Hotjar in, because it is in breach with their anti-hate and uh, anti-racism rules. This is a major um, announcement, I think, especially in this age of the internet where you know companies are really held accountable for what they boast as their core values. Um, essentially, they said that all the money and the revenues earned from these accounts will be um, donated to anti-racist causes and they will also be donating 50,000 euros um, extra to these causes. I think it's a super cool um, initiative. Some may say they're snowflakes, I just say they're sensible. I just think that there's no room you know, for racism, especially if you proclaim so you know, for, your, for your marketing campaign. What do you think? I mean, I think it's a very, it's a, it's a very good initiative. You know? I mean, it's very easy for these uh, big companies to just go, and he- go ahead and say they're against um, against um, a number of causes, but only a few of them actually uh, have the guts to take action against them. So I think it's very, um, it's a very good move um, for Hodjar to actually go out and um, uh, make this move. You know, and I think it's fair to say that they've had their fair share of um, this move has had its fair share of positive reception online. I mean, people all over Twitter, uh, Facebook, everyone's been uh, praising Hodjar. So yes, good also Hodjar. On to our next story for today, school guidelines for kindergarten and post-secondary published. So weeks ahead of schools reopening, um, guidelines for sixth forms, MCAS and kindergartens were finally published yesterday. A lot of students, a lot of teachers, a lot of parents were anxious about um, these guidelines as it seemed like the day for the reopening of schools was forever getting closer and yet um, they didn't really have a word about what exactly was going to happen. Nonetheless, here are some of the guidelines for six forms in them costs. So uh, most of these will abide by some of the most talked about measures, that is mask wearing, social distancing, contact tracing. Um, for example, staff members at six forms and post-secondary institutes like MCAST will have to wear their mask at or visors at all times. Uh, students, on the other hand, will have to wear their masks at all times inside classrooms. The guidelines also stated that in the in the event um, that the, the COVID-19 situation gets any worse, gets out of hand, there is always the possibility of partial or full school closure with lessons taken back uh, virtually um, to digital learning. Now for the kindergarten, I believe some of these guidelines will be a huge headache for parents and for teachers because as we all know, it's harder to enforce uh, some of these guidelines with very, very young kids. So some of these guidelines include uh, that containers must be disinfected for eating, that lunch boxes have to be disinfected before students eat, and students are no longer allowed to bring in personal toys, that is toys from their home so to school. so sad, isn't it? And I also heard that there's going to be socially distanced naps as well. I think something very particular to the, to the pandemic time. I, I don't know how they're going to enforce this. I, I have <laughs> No we just idea. have to see until, until you know, the time comes. And I think you know, now that, that these guidelines have been issued, we're still waiting for the university ones, I believe. Mm-hmm. I think, is, this, is it going to make a difference to COVID-19 numbers? And we'll just have to see in the next two weeks. Now let's move on to our next story, a very serious one. Um, the sister of Sui E murder victim, Eleanor Mandron Walker, has spoken out after the suspect was released on bail 
again for the second time. So just to refresh, um, Eleanor Manjon Man John Walker was killed in a brutal domestic violence attack in 2016 by her ex-husband who was charged and then turned himself in. So this was in 2016, he was released on bail two years later then following two um, aggravated thefts and a violent robbery, he was arrested again, kept in prison for two years and now has been released again on bail. And of course, um, her sister, Melissa Gould, as well as the family have spoken out and, and of course they are appalled by this decision. They say that our judicial system is in a shambles and rightly so. This, this, um, it, it, this all ties into this issue we have in Malta about court delays mm -hmm. and, and um, I mean, just speaking about the most recent, you know, shocking double murder, you know, of um, Ivor Majewski and Christian Paldofino who were, who were killed in their home. Um, Daniel Muka, one of the prime suspects, was um, released on bail after a violent robbery. So I think, you know, this is f shedding further light on, on this very, very serious situation we have in Malta with these court delays. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's I think it's becoming increasingly clear that these, uh, these institutions need a bit of a reform. I wonder when it's going to come, however. Okay, on to our next story. Animal Welfare Director speaks out amid backlash. So unfortunately throughout the past few months Malta has been witnessing a surge in cases of animal abuse and during these times inevitably the spotlight falls on Malta's animal welfare. Now lately and in recent years basically ac animal activists all over the country have been very vocal um, about these cases of animal abuse. Animal activists have been very very vocal about animal welfare's alleged inaction. Um, however, I believe that um, through all this um, criticism, which oftentimes I believe is very justified, um, sometimes the, the good that animal welfare actually does do um, might be overshadowed. So in light of this, uh, Lava Motor spoke to uh, Noel Montebello, the director of animal welfare, to get a bit of a clearer view about what actually goes on at animal welfare. Now, from what we found out, it seems like animal welfare is severely, severely understaffed. Um, uh, Noel Montebello brought up the fact that animal welfare takes around 6,000 calls per year, but has 50 workers. The Civil Protection Department, on the other hand, takes 5,000 calls a year, that's 1,000 calls less, and yet it has 300 workers. So, it's pretty, it's pretty clear that there is a bit of an issue with lack of resources. Um, however, Noel Montebello also highlighted that um, a number of improvements have been made to laws that seek to protect animals. He brought up, for example, Carozzini laws, which gave horses an extra three hours of rest. Uh, however, he also highlighted that the organization is ultimately human. Now, the statement triggered a number of animal activists uh, because I, I believe when there's animals, the, the lives of innocent animals at stake, uh, it isn't enough to just justify any issues by saying that you are human. Um, however, when Noel compared animal welfare to his foreign counterparts, it seems like animal welfare might actually be doing an okay job. I mean, he said that um, uh, foreign um, SPCAs, for example, actually euthanize um, dogs, as is widely known. However, he said that animal welfare does not actually put <coughs> any animals to sleep. So it's an ever-developing story. Um, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this in, uh, in, in, in due time. Indeed, it, it just reminds me of, of you know, the situation in the GU clinic, which is a story that, I, that I'm very passionate about and I follow a lot. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a government, um, let's say, part of a government institution. You know, it's severely understaffed, it's overloaded with cases, there's a huge backlog. And unfortunately, we, direct, we tend to direct the anger you know, directly at them when we should be directing it at the government for not pro providing them with more uh, resources. So let's head on to our last story before we bring on our special guest. Entertainment, a new uh, entertainment lobby has proposed um, a number of uh, proposals, including COVID-19 vouchers uh, to be used in the arts. Very interesting over there. So yesterday, the MEIA um, had a press conference, which essentially they, they laid out their proposals um, on how Malta needs to you know, step up its game and support the entertainment industry and artists and as an artist myself you know I'm 100% I'm, I'm behind them um, one of the most interesting ones I found which which played on this um, the government's COVID-19 vouchers was providing 20 euros to spend on any kind of cultural services or goods to to give artists that well-needed um, kick at that time um, I think 
it all ties into to, um, Malta not giving enough importance to the arts. Um, and you know the fact that arts has been on the back burner, even though this pandemic has been going for half a year, I think is something that that we need to talk about, you know, on a national level. And I'm super happy to 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 um, to be talking to Howard Keith de Bono uh, this morning about this. Um, talking about COVID-19, um, just to give you our COVID-19 update before we bring on our guest. Um, I believe there were 49 cases yesterday, mm -hmm. and and I think 48 recoveries. Um, we have heard through the grapevine that Malta is expecting one of the highest uh, numbers of active cases, of new cases. Today <laughs> it seems to be in the triple digits, which if true would bring us up to uh, more than 600 active cases. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, seeing this as well as the fact that um, schools are going to reopen in two weeks is, is something super, it's, super mm -hmm, concerning. Mm -hmm. it's, pretty, it's pretty crazy. And I mean, it makes these proposals for the arts even more pertinent, I believe. Uh, having said that, um, uh, welcome to our show, Howard. Um, how are you? Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Great. Um, now, um, would you like to start off with your questions? To. So, Howard, you have you are the president of the MEIA. Could you tell us why you felt that that um, you know this group needed to be formed and and the situation for artists and and people in the entertainment industry um, and how they're affected by COVID nineteen? Well, it was initially my idea in March. I would say end of March, beginning of April. Not that there have there have been other attempts in the past, um, but I think what happened in the past, everyone was looking at it in a dissected way, dissected sectors. And I said, look, the whole entertainment and arts is a holistic, has to be a, a holistic approach. Um, so I was looking at ten pillars, ten sectors: um, dance, music, theatre, film and TV, entertainment venues, supply and service providers, the whole right, visual arts, etc. And um, you know, I was seeing, I was seeing during the whole pandemic when it, when it hit us, that there was no, no reference at all to our sector. There were there was the tourism lobbying, there was a building construction lobbying, and nothing about us. I said this is not right. You know, so we have to do something about it. And I started. I, I made a set of plans. The first person I called was uh, the president of Chamber of Commerce, who I respect a lot, David Trier. I think it's been quite on top, on top of the, the game with regards to this and is great help for the country. So, um, you know, we as a country, we used to having the politicians dictate the narrative and come up with the policies. In the absence of lobby groups as associations have to bridge that gap. And I guess that is the main intention because there was absence. There was a passive approach and there was no public narrative about it. And obviously, Parallel with all that, I was seeing the news that other countries were coming up with, like 1.9 billion euros for the art and uh, art entertainment uh, recovery plan. Millions of euros here, millions of euros there. I said, okay, where's, well, we're waiting. Six months down the line, nothing happened. We've been officially launched um, through an AGM, through Chamber of Commerce, so the Executive Committee and Advisory Committee elected uh, just a month and a half and it's, ago, and it's been uh, literally a tsunami. I mean, uh, we haven't stopped. So that's the whole reason behind it. Interesting. Uh, I think it's interesting to know that, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to the pandemic, it is the arts that get um, the brunt of these uh, regulations. I mean, recently, um, some club owners, some DJs have been speaking out, saying that even though they were forced to close uh, in, in the past weeks, um, Malta is still seeing um, a huge surge of cases um, hit, hit, hit the country. Um, uh, currently, um, do you think that um, do you think that clubs should have closed? Do you think that it well, did come? I'm going to be honest with you. We, you know, when there was a particular press conference, I believe mid June, and I was surprised. I was surprised that our re-entry back was an explosion of everything is is okay, and that should have never happened. I think in hindsight, all authorities recognize that. Um, in fact, I was having discussions with health authorities how to plan in the Caribbean. So, you know, that, that surprised me and I believe that was the main cause. But besides that, because there is the whole tourist, tourism borders, it's a whole holistic thing. You can just can't blame it on, on one event or one club or, or one sector. It doesn't work that way. Um, and I, I, I would have to say that 
in fact, we had we did three particular measures according to our timeline. One of them was to immediately recommend a list guidelines of how to operate. So restrictions, health restrictions, um, curbed entries, risk assessments, because you can't just put everyone in, in one. So you know, okay, so one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so therefore, yes, you can have events which can happen at 100 people, even probably 500. But even if, even even more, if the restrictions are in place. Mm -hmm. If not, then you're going to have a mess. So that was the reason. And the second was that, um, besides all that, that when, when we, we gave these recommendations and they were implemented immediately, they were implemented because it was logical, right? Um, unfortunately, the outbreak was too late. It was mm -hmm. too late in mm -hmm. the day, and that is what happened. And to answer your question bluntly, you're absolutely right. Last, I believe we had a record of cases of 78 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a few days ago. We haven't had events for the last month, even more than that now. Um, I had also gave a suggestion internally through, through internal channels that we, we would be ready as a, as, a, as a community, as an industry, to even do a, a three-week moratorium. Okay. So at that point, where it was bad, I said, mm -hmm. look, we get it. Let's, it's not going to be enough time to, to do the changes, so let's stop for three weeks, assess the situation, and then carry on slowly back again. That didn't happen, and, and then the result was there. So yeah, unfortunately we get the blame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not saying that there weren't some irresponsible events, but there were lots of responsible events as well. You know, so there are no outbreaks at all in most of the events. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think the proof is in the pudding. Um, a month later, and the numbers are still going up. Mm -hmm. to us. So. Do you think the fact that um you know, arts were given the short end of the stick, you know, it's six months down the line and there's no, you know, plan for, for all the artists and, and, um, and entertainers in Malta. Do you think this is also endemic of a larger issue we have in Malta about, about respecting Absolutely. artists and independent artists and... and Absolutely. Why is other countries place the creative sector bang in the middle of all other sectors? We tend to put it outside. Um, so, if, unless we look at the creative sector as a strategic national resource and look at the intrinsic value that it has, um, and also just, just, just solely look at the GBA figures for the last three years, if you want to look at it just strictly on the economic side, if you, if you want, I wouldn't suggest that because I, think, I, I believe that arts and culture is way beyond that and really needs our well being and the whole freedom of expression and all that. But if you had to use that hat, the economic hat, you see that we actually doubled the building industry. And here you have a situation where that particular, and it's, it's a good thing, what they did, I think was very good, very clever, and I definitely believe it was something um, which was helpful for the country and the economy. But it's, 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 it was an industry which operates and contributes half of what we do. And the numbers, our numbers are much bigger. And they were given incentive, we, have, we were given no incentives. So there you have it. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is another case, our education. So we had, we had to intervene to come up with, with um, guidelines and recommendations how to operate. So in the private sector, there are about 10 to 12,000 students who depend and their parents, you can imagine, who are waiting eagerly to know how, what, what's going to happen. So the schools, all the private schools, all, all the people who invested so much, millions in their, in their operations. And there were no guidelines given. There was a lot of attention given to academic schools. So once again, the arts education took a back step and was sidelined. It was, has been so in the past. We had to, to be fair, there was a, we had a great collaboration with the Ministry of Education and, and the, the public health as well with this. So they, they endorsed our recommendations. Um, it's in the process, but I believe we're there. So yes, we, you know, we just have to have a bit of a loud voice to make sure that they, they get it. Mm -hmm. Um, great. Uh, one last question, I believe, before we close. Um, do you think that um, this proposal, this 20 euro voucher proposal, will solve the crisis that the arts find itself in? No, it won't. Um, it is only part of parallel things. It is one measure out of ten. If you only focus on one measure, so if you have consumers who maybe might be ready to look at that scenario, you need content. Mm -hmm. So we have to first, we have to supply the content, we have to make sure that the professionals and the suppliers are taken care of. It's a whole chain of things. All together, all 10 measures together, and, and we look at things holistically to make sure that everyone, including entertainment venues, everyone, 
um, and even guarantee facilities. So, you know, most people don't understand this is not an instant service provider. Yeah. You don't just open the door tomorrow and back in the game. Mm -hmm. You have three months, six months, sometimes a year of preparations to get something done. The insurances don't cover that. So, and because of the force majeure, obviously. So, in this particular case, we're asking for the government to intervene as a guarantee. So, if whatever project event happens within six months down the line and can't happen, eventually because of the restrictive measures, then that guarantee kicks in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to look at things holistically, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a big help. Absolutely. All together, it all makes sense. Of course. Uh, super, I believe that brings us to the end of this episode of Love and Daily. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you have a day full of love.